All right, so let's begin with a little timeline of how the pandemic went down and a few local events of interest that, that brought me into, um, into, this, into this field a little bit. So on December 21st, 2019, the Chinese CDC identified a cluster of pneumonia patients. Uh, a little bit later, the causative agent was identified as a coronavirus. On January 10th, 2020, the first genome, the sequence of letters that make up the genetic information of SARS-CoV-2 was released into a public database. Uh, Jason's lab, uh, my co-panelist, Jason McClellan's lab, uh, quickly uh, realized the importance of this uh, cluster of events and immediately started working on understanding a very important protein. We'll hear a lot about this protein called spike. Okay. This protein is uh, the basis for all of the vaccine designs currently uh, available. All of the vaccines currently available. So uh, in just a month, this is breakneck speed for science. The McClellan lab solved the three-dimensional shape or the structure of the spike protein, which opened up vaccine uh, structure-based vaccine design. Concurrently, about a month later, uh, concurrently around February, the first documented cases of SARS-CoV-2 patients uh, started showing up in Texas. Uh, analysis after that showed that actually SARS-CoV-2 was circulating uh, at some low frequency in Texas much earlier. But uh, in February, these patients started showing up and started being calling COVID patients. COVID is, of course, the disease caused by the virus, SARS, caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. So uh, on March 13th, the state of Texas declared a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. On that same day, UT Austin shuts down operations for the first time in my history at UT. Uh, as we were sitting at home, my lab was trying to think of ways to help out with the pandemic because by that point it became clear to the world that this is going to be a pandemic and we need to all help, in, uh, help out as we can as scientists and communicators and educators. So this is when uh, I got in touch with Dr. McClellan and together with Dr. Maynard, uh, we formed a collaborative effort to further continue designing this all critical spike protein, which, which led into a wonderful collaboration and a, and a second generation spike protein. A few months later, uh, I started working with the lab of uh, Jim Moser at Houston Methodist. He's a clinician and he tracks viral variants. And they have been doing this since March of 2020 because the scientists um, who do pathogenesis and, and emerging pathogens knew that the virus is not gonna stay still. The virus is gonna continue to mutate, adapt, evolve. And so we started helping out there and that collaboration continues. And perhaps with, uh, with uh, Dr. Moser's uh, collaboration, this effort is probably the biggest genomic surveillance effort for viral variants in the state of Texas that I know of, frankly. Now, a key date, uh, and, and in this time, Dr. McClellan's lab has contributed in so many ways to the pandemic uh, uh, in terms of therapeutics, vaccine design, that I, I really can't begin to list all of them, but he has been working uh, in many fronts, including designing therapeutic antibodies, many, many different types of uh, antibodies in terms of understanding viral variants and what they mean, and in terms of continuing to understand the functions of this all-important spike protein, which we'll hear a lot about. But on December 11th, 2020, uh, almost uh, slightly less than a year uh, after the first cases were identified by the Chinese CDC, the United States started vaccinating uh, frontline healthcare workers with the first EUA-approved Pfizer uh, vaccine. Now, this is an incredible breakneck speed, less than a year from identifying the first cluster of patients in China to having a vaccine broadly, oh, not broadly available, but uh, a first generation vaccine available to the frontline healthcare community in the United States. Um, shortly thereafter, the Moderna vaccine became approved for EUA use. And now uh, just today, the Biden administration announced that by May, they expect all um, adults to have access to a vaccine in the United States. All adults that want access to a vaccine have that access. So how did we get here? How, could, how did this happen so quickly? Uh, Jason is gonna to talk to you about the technologies and the science that enabled this rapid pace of breakthroughs. I just wanna give you the punchline first, okay? The, the punchline that I want you to walk away with, uh, if you hear nothing else today, is that these vaccines, all of these vaccines are remarkably effective at preventing death and severe COVID. So now we have three vaccines, we are lucky to have three vaccines available for uh, emergency use, emergency use authorization in the United States, including the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is being deployed this week. Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, of course, have been deployed. And there's other vaccines coming around. 
There's over 200 vaccines in the pipeline right now globally. Um, these three vaccines, and actually all of the vaccines with fake, clean phase three data, um, are 100% effective at, at preventing hospitalization and de uh, preventing death from COVID-19. That's a remarkable achievement. Um, this is the one thing that went very, very well in this pandemic. The spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 is an excellent vaccination target. But this is phase three clinical trials. We've now had sufficient data out of a few countries to see how this vaccine is performed in, in, the, in the real world. So this is data coming out of uh, Israel, which has had the most robust and aggressive vaccine campaign of any nation. They're exclusively using the Pfizer vaccine. They have a small urbanized population, a very strong national health healthcare system with data tracking. And so they're able to conduct these studies uh, very well. So this is now a study of 6,000 patients uh, in each arm. This is, this is not a clinical trial, this is real world. They're comparing patients that are matched otherwise, uh, but, but one arm received vaccines and the other did not receive vaccines. So the study uh, sort of tracks lots of different metrics from how, for how this vaccine is performing in the wild. Uh, and um, the key point here, again, looking at the cumulative incidence of death from 600,000 patients, right? So each one of these steps up as a patient passing away from COVID-19, and this number keeps going up. But if you look at the vaccines, if you look out uh, maybe two weeks from when the second shot was administered, okay, the, this line begins to this this begins to flatline in the blue curve, meaning these vaccines are incredibly effective at preventing death in the real world administration, where sometimes you don't get the dose on time, sometimes the patient doesn't show up, sometimes the, the dose isn't refrigerated properly, and so on. In addition, um, Israel has now been dominated by this B117 variant, the UK variant. Okay? It's a dominant in Israel. And clearly the Pfizer vaccine, and there's no reason to believe other vaccines are different. The Pfizer vaccine is quite effective at preventing um, severe COVID-19 outcomes in these patients. Okay? Similar results are showing up in the UK with a different vaccine and amongst US frontline medical workers. These vaccines are incredibly effective. So when your turn comes to get a shot, don't wait out for the best vaccine. There's reasons why you can't even compare the numbers that you've seen uh, because of the difference in variants and difference in design outcomes. Get the vaccine, it saves lives. All right, so my final thought here before I hand it over to Jason is, what can, when can we return to normal? That's the main question everyone's asking, right? Is it SARS-CoV-2 eradication? Is it herd immunity? What is herd immunity? Is it the removal of statewide restrictions? We're there now in Texas, right? Uh, is it maintaining local healthcare capacity so that uh, people who come down with COVID-19 can be treated? Or is it merely reduction in personal case severity? These are just some of the things I think about when I think about what returning to normal may look like. Okay, and these are sort of ordered in terms of, uh, I would say, the most difficult, in fact, impossible. It's the first bullet point to something that could happen once you get your second shot or you wait a little bit after your second shot, which is reduction in personal severity. These are questions that I think our public leaders have um, sometimes mixed and matched, and it's not clear exactly what our national strategy is, at least to me, which of these are we shooting for? In fact, the first bullet point is essentially impossible. We will not eradicate SARS-CoV-2. Um, so this is, this is just to stimulate some discussion. I'm gonna um, skip forward. I'm not gonna talk about herd immunity in the interest of time, but I'm gonna skip forward and hand it over to Jason who can tell you about what this beautiful picture means and, and his uh, phenomenally important role in getting these vaccines out to us so, so quickly. So Jason, feel free to also address the speculative questions I put up in the last slide as well. Yeah. What does normal sure. look like? Let me try and get through some of the slides. Also a lot of great questions in the Q&A to, to get to as well. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the spike protein, what we know about coronaviruses, how the spike protein functions, the role of my lab and others, structural biology, being able to determine three-dimensional structures of the protein, how we leverage that for vaccines, how the some of the vaccines work at a molecular level, and hopefully that'll uh, clear up um, some confusion and, and misunderstanding. Uh, so Ilya, please advance. All right. So coronaviruses are not new to scientists. Uh, we've known about coronaviruses since the 1960s. They're really diverse, large family of enveloped RNA viruses. So they're enveloped in the sense that they have a, uh, a membrane. The membrane is derived from the human cells or host cells from which they bud. Uh, they have an RNA genome, um, a positive sense RNA genome. And there are four 
genera, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronaviruses. Human coronaviruses belong to the alpha and beta genera. There are four coronaviruses that circulate annually in humans, seasonally, uh, and they are one of the many causes of the common cold. And so those are in the lower right-hand corner, uh, 229E and NL63 are, are the alpha cobies. And then we also have in the upper left in lineage A of beta coronaviruses, HKU1 and OC43. And so many of us have likely been infected by one or more of those. And they generally cause an, a mild upper respiratory tract infection. And then we have the zoonotic coronaviruses that were in animal reservoirs. Um, the primary reservoir for coronaviruses are bats, because bats are mammals. And then they eventually jump species, possibly through an intermediate host like the palm civet for the first SARS-CoV back in 2002, to dromedary camels for MERS-CoV. And that's where we see the MERS-CoV, a lineage C beta coronavirus, and the SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, lineage B beta coronaviruses. So there's a lot of diversity and that can make it difficult to generate vaccines that work against all of them. Uh, but that is something actually my lab is starting to work on now. All right, so a prominent feature of coronaviruses, which led to their name, are these fringes around the surface of the spike of the virus shown on the left. So on the left is a, a negative stain uh, electron micrograph of a coronavirus particle. Um, you can see that they're, they're kind of spherical. It's part of them as pleomorphic because they're not perfect spheres. And they have these club-like protrusions coming off the surface. And researchers noted that. So on, on the right is a little uh, snippet from the journal Nature. See, it's dated November 16th, 1968. And so they're describing that the particles are more or less rounded in profile, and they have this characteristic fringe of projections, about 200 angstroms long, which are rounded or petal shaped. And this appearance recalls the solar corona shown in the middle. And so they propose that this family of viruses should be called coronaviruses. So we've known about these for decades. What structural biology tries to do is provide high resolution information for the various components of the virus. And so we can start with the image in the upper left showing this very fuzzy club-like projection coming out. And up until even uh, 2013, 2014, when my lab first started working on coronaviruses, we didn't know what the molecular structure of the spike protein was. Uh, how does it fold? How do all of the amino acids fold into one functional protein? And with structural biology, our collaboration with Dr. Barney Graham and Dr. Andrew Ward, uh, we were able to determine the first coronavirus spike structure uh, for a human coronavirus, and that's shown in the middle. Uh, that's for the human coronavirus HKU1, and that revealed tons of information. Like we can essentially 3D print the, the molecular structure of the spike protein and understand how it moves, how it binds to receptors. Uh, we could also use this information, as we'll show, to rationally make changes to the spike protein to try and make it a better vaccine immunogen. So this first structure was determined back in 2016. Next. Okay. So since people are interested in technology, one of the major advances that allowed us to uh, determine structures of coronavirus spike protein are these advances in a technique called cryoelectron microscopy. Electron microscopy has been around since the 1930s, but uh, it's similar to light microscopy where we, we look through lenses and use light, uh, but there the resolution is limited by the wavelength of light, which is at the lower end around 400 nanometers. So to look at protein molecules and atoms within protein molecules, we need to use a source that has an even smaller wavelength. And fortunately, electrons moving at near the speed of light have picometer wavelengths. And that's what these electron microscopes do. They use a beam of electrons that are focused by lenses, which are actually electromagnetic coils. 
uh, onto the sample. They go through a very thin layer of the sample and collect an image. And there's just been tons of advances in the, in the instrumentation, the use of uh, new CMOS detectors in 2012, a lot of machine learning and computation for data processing. So it's been major technological advances that have allowed us to determine these high resolution structures of, of viruses and viral proteins. All right, this is a little, um, earlier some animation, so I'll just tell you when to advance. So this is a little bit on how the um, electron microscopy works. So we try to purify the, the sample. In this case, many individual spike proteins we were able to produce in our lab, free from any other viral material. And we then try and freeze it in a very thin layer of, of water that is then plunged frozen into liquid ethane to form this vitreous ice. Um, and that's what we see on the left. So this is an electron micrograph, a transmission electron micrograph containing these small particles frozen. And the contrast is really qu quite poor because proteins uh, aren't that much more dense than the surrounding water. Uh, but with some additional computation and denoising, deconvolution, uh, we can get slightly better images. So yeah, great. Uh, and now we can hopefully start to see some of these individual proteins that are th frozen in this thin layer of vitrified water. And then these individual protein images, these projection images of these thousands of proteins uh, can then be picked either manually or now using machine learning algorithms. Okay. And so that allows us to kind of box out these individual particles and extract 2D boxes around each of the particles that can then be averaged and grouped together to improve signal to noise, generating these really nice 2D class averages. So this is some of the initial images we saw of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, probably on the January 30th or 31st, if that's the date. Uh, and you can see the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in different orientations, side views, top views. And then computationally, we're able to generate a three-dimensional object that's consistent with all of these individual 2D projections. And that gives us a potential density map that we can then build into to finally determine the structure and identify where all the amino acids in the protein occurs. And based on our work and many other structural biologists in the community, uh, we now have a really good sense of how these spike proteins work. And so next is an animation from Dr. Janet Awas's lab using some of our structural information and others, which I hope to try to show you the first parts of SARS-CoV-2 viral entry. Jason, are you going to narrate or is I'm there a narrate. audio? You'll narrate? Yeah. Okay. SARS-CoV-2. SARS Perfect. So this is what we're seeing is our best representation now of what a SARS-CoV-2 virion looks like. There's about 25 to 35 individual spike proteins on the surface of the virion. They're actually very flexible and dynamic and they can move around. When the virion first approaches uh, one of our cells in our respiratory tract, it encounters a variety of different proteins on the surface. The spikes are undergoing some dynamic conformational changes in green, interacting with the receptors in purple. Receptor binding actually destabilizes the spike, causing it to start to undergo conformational changes. Additional proteins on our surface called proteases, shown in orange and yellow, then start to make small cuts in the protein, which further destabilizes it. At that point, one of the subunits of the spike, called S2, is initially in a prefusion state, shown here, and then undergoes a dramatic conformational change where it shoots part of itself into our host cell. Then the spike protein begins to collapse down onto itself into uh, forming a hairpin and what we now call as a post-fusion conformation. That fuses the viral membrane and the host cell membrane together and allows the contents of the virus to enter our cell. So we know a lot about spikes now, which means that we can start to really rationally design optimal vaccines from this work. Right. So when we think about vaccines, maybe a, a brief introduction on how our immune system works. So on the left, we're showing natural infection, 
we have some SARS coronavirus variants uh, infecting a person. If that person survives, they mount an immune response that has different arms to it. So there, it generates um, some individual B cells that can be very long lasting called memory B cells. Um, those can also differentiate into plasma blasts that can secrete antibodies that can bind to the surface of the spike and, and inactivate the virus. And then it can also elicit different combinations of T cells, CD4 positive, CD8 positive T cells. And many of these can last a very long time and are called memory cells. And potentially for some viruses, measles and others can last a, a lifetime. Um, and what happens then is it takes a little while days to weeks to make these initial responses. And we may not survive during that, but if we do, we have these for a very long time. So what vaccination is trying to do is mimic that initial infection. Uh, we want to present either the entire virus or parts of the virus to our body, cause it to generate an immune response that is very similar to, or even better than the immune response from natural infection and generate all the same types of B cells, plasma blasts, antibodies, and T cells. And then when we encounter the virus again, we already have these sentinels, these guards ready to protect us and prevent us from getting either infected or severely ill from the infection. So we have a lot of decisions to make for vaccine development, right? So our target is in the center. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 variant, it's maybe, uh, six, seven different proteins available in the virion. It actually encodes for around 30 or so proteins. Um, so we can't infect somebody with the actual virus because that, that, that's not much of a vaccination. Um, we have options such as inactivated, uh, which is shown there. That's a little tricky because you have to grow up large quantities of a highly infectious virus and then try to inactivate it. You have to completely inactivate it, but you don't want them to inactivate it too much to where you start causing the proteins to misfold and change conformations. Um, and, and so th th that's not really being pursued. Another option is live attenuated vaccines. Uh, that's where you can try to make a weaker form of the virus. That has worked well for, for many, many vaccines, many pathogens, but it takes time and you have to make sure that it's properly attenuated. If you attenuate it too much, it doesn't generate enough of an immune response. If you don't attenuate it enough, uh, you can cause uh, severe infections. And so that, that approach really isn't being pursued uh, for any of the, the COVID-19 vaccines in the US. Then we have some other options like the protein subunit where we try to target one or two proteins that we know are critical for the virus and that our body mounts a good immune response against. So that would be like the spike protein. But the question is, do we use the whole spike protein? Do we use a portion of it? Do we try and focus the immune response? And that's where a lot of the structural biology and understanding of COVID-19 survivors and what types of responses they make can guide vaccine development. And once we settle on something like that on spike, we have to decide what shape. Do we want it in the pre-fusion form, or the post-fusion form? Do we want to grow up large quantities of spike in bioreactors and inject that directly into our arms? That's the approach that Novavax is taking. Or do we want to just give our bodies a recipe, the instructions for it to make the spike protein? And that's how the DNA, the mRNA, and the viral vector approaches from uh, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, and uh, Pfizer, that's how those vaccines work. They're just providing a recipe to our cells and instructing them to make spike protein in this case, stabilizing a particular confirmation. Right. So from the video, you can see that that spike protein undergoes a lot of conformational changes. It starts in the left conformation, this pre-fusion form, the active form, which is capable of binding to our cells. And then due to interactions with receptors, with proteases, or just sometimes even spontaneous, it can trigger to this post-fusion form. Uh, and so what we really, have focused on. We've been working on coronaviruses since 2013. Uh, we showed four years ago that these pre-fusion forms of the spike are the optimal vaccine antigen. And what we had to come up with was a method of stabilizing it in the pre-fusion form on the left and preventing the spike from undergoing the conformational change to the post-fusion. And we did a lot of this work back on uh, back with the MERS coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, 
Uh, so on the left shows what happens if we purified the MERS coronavirus spike, uh, just the spike protein that's naturally encoded by the virus, we would get a mixture of these pre-fusion and post-fusion forms. And we could see them in electron micrographs. The, the red boxes show the post-fusion and the blue boxes show the pre-fusion. So this is not an optimal vaccine. It's heterogeneous and some fraction of the molecules aren't in the right conformation. Uh, but using the structural biology, we were able to go in and specifically mutate two residues uh, to another amino acid called proline. So we, so we call it this 2P2 proline approach that rigidifies the spike and prevents the conformational changes. And so you can see the MERS S2P spike, these modified spikes were just all homogeneous pre-fusion spikes. And what's cool is that the region that we engineered the stabilizing mutations into is structurally really important and is highly conserved among different coronaviruses. So this trick also worked with the first SARS coronavirus back from 2002. So there, just using the wild type spike, again, we got a mixture of pre-fusion and post-fusion spikes, but putting the two prolines in the exact same place, we were able to make pre-fusion SARS-CoV-1 spikes. And so all this is back in 2017. So we were well prepared for if a beta coronavirus like SARS ever emerged, we knew exactly how to stabilize it in the pre-fusion conformation. And that's what we were able to do. As soon as the sequence was released on January 10th of 2020, within an hour, we were able to design in the stabilizing mutations, collaborate with Dr. Barney Graham at the NIH, who was working with Moderna, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, uh, many companies uh, were aware of our work and used those stabilizing mutations. And that's shown on the next slide. Oh, sorry. And then, yeah, so 20 days after the viral genome was published, uh, we were able to mutate two residues in this region and uh, purify protein and determine the entire three-dimensional spike structure shown here. So that's the first 3D structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike published 30 days after a genome of a novel variant of a novel virus um, was published. And so these are the four COVID-19 vaccines all use our pre-fusion two proline stabilized spike. And so the two prolines are at positions 986 and 987. See both Moderna and Pfizer and BioNTech. Uh, they're in, they have mRNA encoding the full spike with the K986P, V987P substitution. Johnson & Johnson in the lower left, they have the adenovirus. Um, they call theirs SPP for two proline. And then Novavax, which has the NVX CoV-2373 highlighted there, circled also has the 2P mutation at 986 and 987. So it's pretty, it's been, it's been really exciting that uh, work we've been doing for, for years before SARS-CoV-2 in anticipation of such an outbreak uh, has been incorporated into four of our, our leading vaccines, three of which are approved and are going into, into people. So it's really years of prior research, both on the development and design of the, the spike antigen as well as the, the platform, like the, the mRNA or adenovirus platforms have, have allowed for the, the rapid vaccine response. And so that's a question that I get a lot. How were we able to do this so fast? So on the top shows traditional development. It can often take years, maybe decades, to figure out what's the optimal antigen to use as the vaccine. And a lot of that's done injecting mice, waiting weeks or months, testing them, a very iterative process. You would then move on to non-human primate studies to sort of escalate. And then eventually you get into some of the preclinical development, toxicology studies. This is all years to close to a decade. After you um, submit the IND to the FDA, you can get approved for clinical trials. Generally do a phase one, can take one to two years based on the results. Um, you would then give a go ahead to begin scaling up additional production to start a phase two which is maybe another two years. And then once that's completed, uh, decide to go for a large 30,000 person phase three uh, study, which can take two to three years. Based on the totality of that data, um, the companies would then decide whether to move forward, regulatory and review. And then finally, you'd start building the plants for large scale production and distribution. So you can see how it would normally take in the 10 to 15 year range. Well, for SARS-CoV-2, we already knew exactly what antigen we wanted to, to, to use. So that was literally within hours, we knew exactly uh, how to modify the spike protein and how to use that. 
The mRNA platforms are actually really mature. I mean, this is the first uh, approved mRNA vaccine, but Moderna has been around for a while. They've had 20, 10 to 20 different mRNA vaccines in people in phase one and phase two trials. So there's a ton of safety data about mRNA vaccines. Um, we could start the human trials just after the mouse studies because we already knew how mRNA encoding prefusion stabilized spikes looked for MERS coronavirus based on our previous work. The clinical trials were generally uh, long, robust clinical trials, but we were able to do them overlapping. So we could start phase two before phase one ended uh, and then have a very robust phase three. And this entire time, in part due to funds from Operation Warp Speed and other, the companies could just begin manufacturing at risk, not worrying about whether it would be approved or not. Um, and so they could just start making doses, building the plants to make these. And if, if it didn't get approved at phase three, they weren't really out any, any additional money. Uh, so the whole thing was able to take 10 months based on a lot of prior research, as, as well as overlapping some of the clinical trials and at-risk uh, production and manufacturing. Jason, can I just jump in real quick because there's sure. a question that's important and this is a key slide that I, I, vaccine hesitancy comes frequently because people are worried that corners were cut, right? And so can you address whether corners were cut in this accelerated timeline, whatever that means? Yeah, I think it depends on how you say corners were cut, right? So th there were overlapping uh, clinical trials, but we also have um, a lot of safety information and uh, you, you know, we started at lower doses, small numbers. So phase one was around 45 people. The first people receiving the, the mRNA vaccine injections were getting the lowest possible dose after waiting one or two weeks to see how that went. You'd go to the, the next higher dose. And, um, and again, we knew how mRNA worked. We knew the spike protein was a good antigen. And then you'd start the phase two, phase three. Uh, mRNA is degraded really quickly in the body so that we're not expecting any long-term effects. Uh, you inject mRNA, it's degraded maybe within days. The spike protein that your body produces uh, from the mRNA is also degraded in days. So nothing really is, sticks around. Yeah, I guess the question is, were there safety things that would have happened in the top, in the top arm that didn't happen in the bottom arm? You would, just have followed, you would just have followed the people longer, perhaps. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So a little bit then on, on the RNA vaccines. Uh, so again, these are kind of new, uh, but we, we group them in genetic vaccines. So more traditional approaches. If you wanted to use spike as your vaccine antigen, uh, we would actually make a stable cell line, like a, a a Chinese hamster ovary cell line that produces grams per liter of spike protein that would then be purified over columns and then biled, and we would just inject spike protein into you. And that's exactly how the Novavax vaccine works. It's just purified spike, and we're not asking the person's body to do anything. For the genetic vaccines, we're taking advantage of the natural flow of information in our cell. Right? So our genetic material is stored safely as DNA. It gets transcribed to mRNA, and that mRNA gets translated into proteins. Uh, so the vaccines, rather than just giving proteins, we can go one step earlier, and we can just inject mRNA that instructs our ribosomes to make spike protein. And, and that has worked really well. And it allows it to go very quickly because the mRNA can be made very quickly. And we can also change it. Um, if we want to make a small tweak to the spike, we just change the nucleotides, right? Just changing the software. Um, so it's a really fast, nimble way of making the vaccines. And this is from the data uh, from Moderna. Uh, looking at the, the phase three data, uh, the blue along the bottom is the uh, vaccine recipients in the phase three receiving the mRNA-1273. And the gray line sloping upwards are those who received placebo. And the y-axis is the, the cumulative event rate, in which case they're, they're looking at symptomatic infections. Uh, so relatively soon after receiving the first and second dose of the mRNA-1273, there's just very few symptomatic infections. And it, it just shows the power. When we talk about flattening the curve, um, there's really nothing quite like an effective vaccine to just prevent the, the severe disease. 
Right. One question we get, I've already had COVID, should I get a vaccine? Absolutely. The response to COVID infections is pretty heterogeneous between people. Uh, some people might mount a re relatively weak immune response after natural infection. Some people, generally the more severe cases, mount a more robust infection. Um, and since we don't have time to screen everybody and figure out uh, how robust an immune response they generated, it's better to just get vaccinated. You'll essentially have super immunity after one shot. Um, Ilya, I don't know if you want to kind of like use the cursor and walk through that, uh, but this is looking at antibodies against spike protein. So pre-vaccination, the group in blue were people who were confirmed to have never been infected. They have very low, essentially zero, antibody titers against the spike protein. Whereas people who are seropositive, they have a pretty big range. I mean, that's a logarithmic scale, right? Going from 10 to close to 10,000. Uh, and then if we look uh, after being vaccinated with just a single dose, by five to eight days after the first dose, most of the people who were not previously infected in blue mount a very, they, they still haven't really mounted an immune response. Whereas everybody who had been previously infected have really boosted their antibody titers are, and are mounting a very strong response. And by two weeks, the 13 to 16 day mark now, um, you can see that being previously infected after just one dose gives you a super strong response. So if you have been infected, uh, definitely get uh, definitely get it again. Or sorry, don't get infected. Uh, get vaccinated, and uh, you'll get just really great immunity. Yeah, we can skip that. Oh, and I guess the side effects are about the same between whether you've had it before or not is what that's showing. Yeah, your first shot, you're going to have the same effects as the second shot for those who are um, not been infected before. So think of the COVID infection as, uh, as your first shot and your, and your actual vaccine as the booster, if you will. I guess that's the point. Okay. Uh, then how durable is the immune response? We can't know until we actually test it. So we can't claim three years of immunity because it's not three years post-vaccination. We would expect something on the order of, of years, one to two years maybe. Uh, it, it's not a simple answer. It also depends on what the virus is doing. So we would be protected longer if the virus had not mutated to make variants. Our protection against the variants, particularly the South African variant, is a bit lower. The efficacy gets reduced by 20 to 30% against the South African variant. In general, vaccines against respiratory uh, pathogens don't provide lifelong immunity. Uh, so if you think of flu, we get constant vaccines. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus is another one. Um, the vaccines go into our arm, right? And they make a systemic immune response that circulates throughout our blood and through our body. But it's really hard to protect the upper airways, the nose, uh, where the virus first enters. And so we will generally get infections even though we've been vaccinated or previously infected. What we're hoping is that the vaccines are still able to provide protection against severe disease and death. But we might need boosters every two, five years, depending on the number of factors that everybody is monitoring very closely. And that's just, yeah, I guess that curve is showing some of the antibody titers as a function of time. Uh, post vaccination. And so, you know, 119 days out from vaccination, the antibody titers are still holding. They're, they will wane over time, uh, but yeah, they look to be holding uh, pretty well so far. And I suppose it's important to note that the antibody titers waning over time is a normal and natural response uh, to a vaccine. Yeah, like there was a lot of fear about, about how antibody titers were waning. Uh, that's exactly what our immune system is meant to do. Um, if they didn't wane, our blood would be a gel of all the antibodies we've raised against all the different pathogens. So we need to ramp up and then ramp back down and make way for other antibodies against different infections. But the key is that we, we are generating memory cells that can last a lifetime that can be re-stimulated upon reinfection to very rapidly produce robust increases in antibodies. I guess that's your end. That's the end of your. Uh... That's the end of, of my spiel, Ilya. Take it over. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm gonna take over a little bit. Thank you, Jason, for all of the vaccine um, information. Vaccines are the end end game here. 
right? We need vaccines, vaccines are the end game. But now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk to you about variants, variants of concern, variants of importance and so on. I'm gonna spend just a few minutes because I really want us to get to the Q&A. You'll have much better questions than we have slides and we can help you with, uh, with addressing those questions. So um, viral variants are here. Somebody asked in the networking session, what's going on in Texas? Um, the answer is I've been working with uh, Houston Methodist since, since the early days. Um, and we have now detected in a preprint that we put out, I believe, yeah, today, um, we have now detected all of the major variants of concern circulating in the greater Houston area via uh, community transmission, meaning the patients that come into the Houston Methodist system that have had their genomes decoded, the viral genomes decoded, did not have any prior, prior travel history. So all of these variants of concern are circulating. And why are they variants of concern? What do all these numbers mean? Okay. So these are scientific names for these variants. This just shows their de um, demographic distribution across the uh, uh, Houston metropolitan area. Uh, and particularly scientists are currently concerned with three variants, uh, B117, which sometimes has a geographic location, United Kingdom variant, B1351, which is uh, first identified in South Africa, and uh, P1 and P2, which are Brazil variants. Okay. These are variants of concern because in, their, uh, they were, in the places where they were initially identified, they have come to uh, represent the majority of infections. So for example, uh, B117 is the dominant strain in the United Kingdom. B1351 is the dominant strain in South Africa. And P1, P2 are the dominant strains in certain places in Brazil. Okay. But what does that mean, right? There could be multiple reasons why a variant of concern becomes dominant in its geographic location. For example, um, somebody was an especially efficient super spreader. Maybe there was an event where uh, a single sick individual seated a whole auditorium worth of people, right? That's called a founder effect, meaning the virus isn't more virulent, the virus isn't more deadly, but they just happened to win the lottery in terms of being uh, uh, hitchhiking on a super spreader. Alternatively, the virus could have adapted or, or increased its virulence. Okay. That's what we're concerned about. So super spreader events in terms of producing variants of concern um, are less worrisome, right? Because that's just human, that's just uh, virus human interactions. What I'm worried about is variants that have increased virulence, i.e. they've increased their transmissibility. So we know for the B117 variant because of a quirk of how it can be identified and because of the excellent surveillance of these variants in the United Kingdom, that it has increased its transmissibility by roughly 50%. It's 50% more infective. You can think of that in real world terms in the sense that, you know, if you were previously told, you know, if you're advised to stay six feet away from someone for accumulated 15 minutes, um, for variant B117, that would actually um, not be sufficient to significantly reduce the, the risk of transmission. It is more transmissive. The lethality of B117 is not yet clear. In the United Kingdom, there were some early reports that it's about 10% more lethal, um, although that's confounded by the fact that their hospital system was also undergoing a lot of uh, overload. So that's confounding the lethality question. But uh, the transmissibility has been replicated in many other countries. In fact, in the United States, B117 is, is, is doubling in frequency every nine to 10 days. So um, current estimates of B117 uh, uh, prevalence in Houston and Texas right now are about 20% of all SARS-CoV-2s. Um, in 10 days, it'll be 40% of SARS-CoV-2. And 10 days after that, it'll be 80% of SARS-CoV-2. So B117 will be the global dominant strain. It's become dominant in pretty much every country that has uh, uh, imported this strain. Whether it escapes the immune system is not yet clear but it seems to be that it's not very good at evading our immune system and by proxy our uh, vaccines okay. or the immune response mounted to our first generation vaccines. Um, B1351 is a variant out of South Africa. It's also been detected in Houston and all over the United States through community transmission. Whether it's more transmissive is not yet clear. Okay. Whether it's more lethal is not yet clear, uh, but it definitely has a partial immune escape. So it evades some of our neutralizing antibody therapeutics, which we can talk about in the Q&A and Jason has been a leader in helping to discover. Uh, it also evades partially the immune response from the first generation SARS-CoV-2 spikes that, that uh, are being injected in people as we speak. 
The P1 and P2 variants in Brazil are, are variants of concern because they dominated a population in a, in a city in Brazil that was already 80% uh, uh, infected for SARS-CoV, or so, 80% or so infected for SARS-CoV-2. So this was a place in the world where herd immunity was achieved the hard way, meaning um, people really got sick, almost the whole city got sick. And then somehow this variant kept reinfecting people, including multiple cases where individuals who have had SARS-CoV-2 were reinfected. Again, um, it has some likely uh, uh, escape from our immune systems. Um, how it's reinfecting people is not clear. That may be part of it, okay? Uh, whether it's more lethal is not clear and whether it's more transmissive is not clear. All of these are being very actively investigated right now. Okay. There are additional variants of interest and note that I uh, um, am not calling them variants of concern because there's just too much panic and scaring uh, happening around this um, outside of the scientific community. We don't know what these variants of interest are doing. There's a variant of interest circulating in California where it's becoming dominant. And there's another variant of interest that is becoming dominant in New York. We don't know what that means. We don't know whether it's more transmissive, more lethal or, or, or any of those things yet, but we're gonna find out soon. There's a lot of people working on this right now. Okay, but the key take home message is these variants are here. Uh, these variants um, may have some partial escape from our current vaccine designs, but uh, our first generation vaccines are still providing a very robust immune response against these variants. In fact, in the United Kingdom and Israel where B117 is dominant, uh, as it will soon be dominant in the United States, the first generation vaccines are still doing an amazing job. Okay. South Africa is in a tough situation because one vaccine manufacturer had to pull out because uh, their vaccine was completely uh, ineffective against B1351. So that has happened in South Africa. I believe it was AstraZeneca vaccine. So um, a second major point regarding these variants of concern and variants of interest is inevitably more will be found. You should not lose sleep over it. Uh, because the world is now focused on finding these, they will be found. Um, but if necessary, our vaccines can be rapidly updated. We went from zero vaccines to over a, a, a 200 vaccines currently in various clinical trials around the world and already three approved for emergency use authorization in the United States. Tweaking these vaccines, as Jason called it, changing them slightly for these variants of concern is not a big deal. We may need to have boosters or updated vaccines. We already do this for flu, right? We have seasonal flu shots and formulations. And uh, so we have the technology, we have the capacity to do this. Um, and there is now a lot of work on trying to design vaccines that would be variant proofed from the get-go. That'll take probably a little bit more time. So. Um, that's, that's me trying to de-escalate the news around these variants. Although in the short term, um, of course, the increased transmissibility of some of these variants, including B117, will potentially lead to a spike in cases before population can, can gain access to the vaccines at the level we need them here. All right, so just a, a quick slide on, on, um, on how we track these variants and all the different tests that you've read about in the news and, what we, uh, and so on. And then I'll finish up and, and um, end on an optimistic note. So um, there's a number of different tests for SARS-CoV-2. There are tests that look at the blood, specifically at the antibody response that you may have generated post an infection or post a vaccination. Okay. These tests don't tell you anything much about the variants. To learn about the variants, you really need to look at the genetic information of the virus in its entirety. And that can be done by taking the viral particles, extracting their genetic information, this, this um, software, if you will, that is encoded in the four letters of the RNA the genetic alphabet. And that can be done by an NP swab or even a saliva test. This genetic information is um, extracted and there are two kinds of tests. The most common test we've all probably had done on us by now is the detection is a yes or no answer, more or less. It's a detection of whether we have SARS-CoV-2. And this test basically just uses molecular diagnostic tools to check for the existence of three regions in this RNA virus. It doesn't read what, the, um, what this virus is, okay? It just checks if these three little pieces of, a, of the RNA, of the SARS-CoV-2 genome are present in our sample. That can be done in a day. This is the PCR test that we've all had done on us by now. But there's a more involved test, which allows us to completely read the software, the operating system, every single letter of this RNA. And this is called sequencing, genomic sequencing. 
And so the process is the same. The RNA is extracted. It's converted to DNA because we actually have DNA sequencing machines, not RNA sequencing machines for technical reasons. Um, every single piece of the virus is amplified. And then using a next generation DNA sequencing approach is developed for completely other purposes, including for the decoding of the human genome project. Um, this is called Illumina sequencing. We are able to read out every single letter of this virus with very high confidence. And by doing that, we can build maps of where the virus is changing. So this is taken from the New York Times, it's very much outdated. There are now over 800,000 or so sequenced uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomes in uh, uh, databases um, that where these are deposited. But here this shows the 30,000 letters of the, of the software that controls SARS-CoV-2. This is the viral genome shown from one to 30,000 on the right. And this little uh, histogram here, these little plots correspond to positions in the, pro in the virus that are prone to mutations, okay? So the longer the bar, the more likely that region of the virus is to mutate. There's various reasons why the virus mutates. In fact, SARS-CoV-2 mutates much slower than other viruses. This is another area where we got lucky in terms of the pandemic. Spike is a very good uh, antigen for vaccines and SARS-CoV-2 is very bad at mutating relative to other viruses. So that's, these are all good things in terms of keeping these variants uh, to a reasonable number. The red box here is actually the spike protein. My lab is very focused, and Jason's as well, on trying to follow the changes in the spike protein in these natural viral isolates so that we don't uh, um, miss out on changes that would invade our vaccines and our, our uh, immune responses, right? So keeping track of spike is critical for making sure that spike hasn't evaded our immune system. So we're doing this as a massive effort with Houston. Um, there's now a massive, uh, there's, so why, is, why didn't we know about these variants before, okay? And the reason is the U.S. had a gap in leadership. Um, the U.S., until very recently, was a laggard in terms of uh, looking at the RNA sequences of the viruses circulating in our populations. This is a heat map showing the viral sequences per thousand COVID-19 cases. Globally, you can see some highlights, standouts. Uh, uh, Japan, um, the U.K. has been amazing. Denmark has been amazing. Israel has been amazing. But I'm oh, sorry, Denmark has been amazing, Israel has been less amazing, but uh, uh, USA ranked somewhere in the low 30s, right? Right above Senegal or below Senegal, Mongolia, and United Arab, Arab, uh, Arab Emirates in terms of being able to track the virus. And of course, now that we have ramped up viral tracking nationally, uh, we are now going to find more variants of interest. And I don't want to call them variants of concern until we actually know that we should be concerned about them. So whenever you hear variants of concern, in the news, convert that to variants of interest because we don't really know what these variants mean. The virus will mutate. Most of those mutations are not that interesting, but we need to keep track of it. All right, so I'm gonna conclude here because we're out of time, but I wanna conclude on an exciting and, and, and um, positive note, okay? On the left, you see a chart showing vaccine development throughout human history. And Jason has already alluded to this. We went from no vaccine for an unknown pathogen to uh, vaccinations of tens of millions of people globally in less than a year. That's a remarkable testament to uh, the ability of humans to come together across uh, the globe to innovate our way out of a cat catastrophe at global scale. This is unprecedented. Now, I've also put together a little list of technical innovations that are going to arise from this pandemic because um, we have learned so much as a result of this pandemic. Yes, we were building the plane while we were flying it, but we, meaning the entire community of pretty much all scientists dropping their work to work on this, or dropping their day jobs to work on the pandemic. But this is just a small sampling of things I could come up with that will remain after the pandemic is under control. mRNA therapeutics are here to stay. mRNA vaccines, first and foremost, but mRNA as a therapy is going to have an interesting uh, th history, uh, an interesting future and it may open up whole new modalities for therapies. Nucleic acid diagnostics, both at the individual and at the population level. This is, this is diagnostics that had to be made for COVID-19, uh, but now we're gonna have diagnostics at home, in our schools, in our wastewater treatment, and uh, personally in the doctor's office. Structure guided vaccine design, Jason has already covered this very beautifully. Therapeutic antibody discovery has taken a major boost in the COVID days, in COVID times. Medical interventions and interventions and drug repurposing, finding drugs that worked for other diseases that can now be used for, for emerging pathogens. Non-invasive COVID detection based on AI and personal health monitoring and so on. 
And on a policy level, we now have the Office of Pandemic and Emerging Threats. Okay, so this is a governmental office that is uh, has as its mission the uh, the role of monitoring globally emerging threats like SARS-CoV-2, so we can be prepared ahead of time. And finally, um, a note that needs to be stressed over and over again: we didn't um, shortcut the line here. We got from virus to vaccine in less than a year because people like Jason and many, many, many others have been working on the fundamental biology of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine design, RNA therapeutics, nucleic acid diagnostics, and so on. And all of these tools could be leveraged at a moment's notice and also uh, coupled with companies that are innovating and governments that are willing to back up this innovation in pandemic times with zero financial risk to the companies. So together, this academic corporate governmental axis of collaboration is what allowed us to um, move from pandemic to vaccine in less than a year. So this is all unprecedented and it's exciting to be living through this. With that, I'm gonna conclude and uh, we'll have time for your questions. Unless Jason wants to add something. Jason, you wanna add something? Um, no, I, I just wanna to get to all the questions. There's tons of good ones. Absolutely. There are so many good questions and we're going to try to roll through them as fast as possible. We have a few closing slides and then a two minute break and then we're going to roll through these questions. So right, uh, Jason and Ilya, hold that thought for one second. We're going to share just real quickly uh, our final slides so that we can get to the uh, our, our the next events. Is that slide showing? Yep, and stick around because after we, we're gonna, Jay doesn't have his regular whiskey shelf behind him where everybody knows where it is, but we're gonna get I, I, I took care of that. So, okay. uh, so we wanna encourage you to join us for more great events. This one's not over, we're about to get to Q&A, but uh, our postponed event from February due to the huge winter storm, we're gonna be doing that on March 9th, how technology is making food faster, better, and safer for more people. So please join us for that event. Uh, April is AI month. We have three different presentations that month, month on what is it, how does it work, why is it important, and more. So we hope you'll join us in April. That'll be the first time ever in the Austin Forum we did three events in a month. In May, we're going to do two. One will be on smart cities. As we start getting back out into our cities again, we want to know how to instrument them to make them better, safer, more mobile, uh, healthier, and so on. Uh, and then we have a new event on May 18th on immersive experiences uh, brought to us by Austin's own Amber Allen of AA Labs. So we're excited about that May 18th event. Uh, in June, we're also going to do two events. So going online has enabled us to increase the event some months. In June, we're going to do blockchain generally on June 2nd and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies on June 16th. We have a lot of other great events coming up in the second half of the year. And remember, we also are increasing our number of small events. So we'll uh, announce our next small group event very soon here. We have a bunch of different ideas for them, everything from movie nights where we have experts answer questions about how realistic was that movie afterwards, more of the tech and whiskey nights. We're going to do some tech book club nights and some other things. So. Uh, we're here with you through this pandemic. We encourage you to continue sheltering, using, making good choices, uh, taking care. And so we're going to have some other events for you here as we uh, have a few more months before we're getting back in person. And like we said, join us, join the Austin Forum Slack workspace. There are a lot of questions that we probably won't get to all of them tonight, uh, but we will invite Ilya and Jason to be answering more of them on Slack and join the conversation, lots of conversations, uh, opportunities and events. Join us on Slack. Again, we wanna thank our annual partners, everybody from AMD to Worley Inc. and everyone in between. Again, we have global companies, we have local companies, we have tech companies, and we have companies that support tech companies. These are the companies that make this happen, make it free and bring this great content to you every month. So thank you to our sponsors. Please support these guys, reach out to them. Wonderful companies. Jess, you're on mute. Okay, I'm off mute now. Okay, and we want to invite you, our amazing and generous community to help others get connected during COVID. Uh, I saw our Austin Pathway friends on here already tonight. If you have old 
older uh, or just unused devices, you can donate them to Austin Pathways. Austin residents need these devices to learn, work, and be well remotely. They will be able to pick, pick them up safely from you, refurbish them, and deliver them to the residents. All you have to do is call the phone number. You'll also get this slide when we send out a follow-up email um, or go to Austin Pathways online and they'll be able to take it from there. And we encourage you to share the Austin Forum with your friends and colleagues. Again, we're going to be online forever now. We will get back to in-person meetings, but we will not stop being online. So share this with your friends anywhere. We hope that they will join. We have a lot of great topics coming up. Every month is different. Every event is different. There is something for everybody. There'll probably be something over the course of the next year in your specialty area. Uh, there'll be a lot of things for you to learn. So please share the events. And we want to hear there's still 150 people here with us tonight. Before we get to question and answer, we want to hear in chat right now. I'm already seeing a lot of great things, but what was the most important thing you learned tonight? So put it in chat. This is what, one of the favorite things. What was the most important thing that you learned tonight? Share it with Ilya and Jason. There was a lot of uh, really positive feedback already about how clear this was, whatnot. What was the most important thing that you learned? Yeah, thanks very much for all the, the kind comments. Yeah, pre-fusion and post-fusion. Thanks, Didi. Yeah, there's a lot of already positive feedback. Optimism. I think people left with more optimism about everything. Absolutely. How the virus works. Sarah, thank you, Sarah. Sarah, you asked some good questions. We're going to answer some of your questions. Pandemic tech will be with us as long as physica, physics has. How much prep was already in place to understand the spike? Yes. Um, the collaboration between researchers. <laughs> Blood would be a gel if antibodies didn't ramp down. Thank goodness it's not. Um, the universal sharing of information without worrying about profits and credit. Um, even though, Russell, yes, even though you you had COVID, you need to get the vaccine. Then you'll get soup. I believe he said it was super immunity too, like better than regular, super duper. So it is 7.34. I would even say like three minutes less than real fast. Go stretch, come right back. Don't go any, don't really go anywhere, uh, but feel free to grab yourself a drink if you are so inclined. Uh, and we are going to have Q&A. If you have been putting questions in Q&A, you will, a few things could happen. We might choose your question and promote you so you can ask it. We might just ask your question. We also might choose your question to be the winning question. You have to, if you put something in Q&A, you have to be present to win because it's very hard for me to find you afterwards because I'm, I don't have people's emails. So if you put something in Q&A, please stick around because we might choose your question as a winning question and you'll get to go to South By. And that video looked really cool. Is Hugh still on here? you got so a lot of other comments. I really Jessica like and I will alternate asking questions. I hope everybody gets a chance to get a drink, take a break real quick. Uh, and we'll see you in about two to three minutes. All right, do we have Jason back? Ilya. Wow, we have 56 questions in the window. We will not get to all of those, but we will, 
We're going to try to roll through as many as we can. Ilya, are you ready to go? Yes, sir. All right. Um, we're going to ask the first question first, just to make it real quick. And Ilya and Jason encourage really short answers. Um, John Rhodes, uh, I want to promote you first. John, are you here? Um, let me check. John, hold on. John is here. Hold on. How about we promote John to ask his first question first? Okay. I'm not sure. You might need to. Sometimes I can't see it. Let's see. John, are you here? Hey, John, we just brought you up. Can you see us? Are you still on with us? Oops, we might need to continue. You want to ask this question? I mean, we could just read through them and just, I mean, yeah. throw a lightning round and try and get through a bunch of them. Well, we were going to try to promote people, but maybe we'll oh, do okay. lightning round. So we're having let's a little do, bit of issue yeah, let's here. Do, we'll do lightning round, especially because there's limited time. Yeah. Whatever. All right. So John Rhodes asks, uh, how safe are vaccines and which one is most effective? Vaccines are very safe. Um, you know, there are always some side effects. They're uh, published. They're not dissimilar to many of the other side effects for, for different vaccines. In terms of efficacy, it depends specifically what the endpoints are. Um, they were generally, the phase three clinical studies were powered to look at prevention of symptomatic infections. Um, those were defined differently, even for the different uh, clinical trials. So a fever plus something else, but, but some symptoms. So the mRNA vaccines are about 95% efficacious in preventing symptomatic infections. Johnson & Johnson is lower in the 70s. They're all 100% effective at preventing death, which is important. Um, so there's just yeah. kind of like different degrees of efficacy depending on what your primary endpoints are. Let me add to that, because this comes up often and it's important to address this question. After that, we'll do light and fast. The best vaccine is the vaccine in your arm, bottom line, okay? Um, second, Comparing vaccine uh, percentages or uh, percent efficacies, as Jason mentioned, is kind of difficult. Um, he mentioned one reason because the endpoints were defined differently between different trials. The second major reason is the variants has shift, have shifted. So the first generation vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, were conducted on a different COVID landscape than the current vaccines. They were all designed with the first generation spike that Jason made So, and his lab made. So um, we don't know what the efficacy of a Moderna vaccine is right now it's certainly lower than 95%. And that's data born out of the Israeli studies, but, or sorry, the Pfizer vaccine, but they're still incredibly effective and you have to think about risk, right? What's the risk of complications, long COVID, um, severe COVID, et cetera. And what's the risk coming from a vaccine? And those are your options, right? It's not vaccine or nothing, it's vaccine or COVID. That's All right. It. Jessica, you wanna ask the next one? Or do they want to do it lightning round? I wasn't sure. Or not, are we pulling? I was just going to try and bang through. I mean, we're up to like 59 open questions. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. How about you all then pick the questions and answer as fast as you can? All right. That sounds good. Uh, they're claiming to support delay and did not mention problems related to delay in terms of a second dose. Um, is there any science for either? Delaying the second dose up to a certain amount of time could actually be beneficial, like potentially up to 12 weeks, you might actually get even an even better response. Um, many of the, the, the common vaccines in childhood are, are several months apart. One reason to do it closer is just so people don't forget to come back for the second one. After 12 weeks or some amount of time, uh, yeah, maybe the booster is not as effective, but as you can see from the people, from the data, people who were infected and then got the vaccination, you still get a boost, you still get a recall. Um, so yeah, it's an important policy decision to make, but the laying should, should not be bad. Right. So I'll, I'll take the next one so we can trade off. How about that? And okay. feel free to jump in on mine. So why do viruses mutate? Do, uh, why are we hearing about this now? Viruses mutate for many numbers for a number of reasons. Um, usually, um, a fundamental mechanism is that viruses, when they copy themselves, they make mistakes. They make typos, if you will. And depending on the virus, those typos can be frequent or infrequent. There are other ways viruses can mutate. So a lot of these mutations actually don't help the virus. They're neutral, or maybe they're even bad for the virus. And those mutations blink out of existence because that virus loses fitness. Some mutations can be jackpot mutations. 
In terms of SARS-CoV-2, one of uh, the leading theories for why we have these variants of concern is that uh, the virus can circulate in immunocompromised patients that can sustain an ongoing infection for months, giving the virus time to actually adapt to our immune system. And that's the, that's, those are the dangerous cases. Okay. So, so you have a follow-up on that one. I think you all sort of hinted at this, but are some of these mutations occurring concurrently in different places, i.e. the rapid spread is not because people travel between them, but because the same mutation occurred yes, in different places? Yes, there's convergent evolution, absolutely. Okay. That's been documented already, and that's normal too. So none of this is breaking new ground in, in terms of the science of, of the viruses or how they replicate. Uh, the reason you haven't heard about this before is because it wasn't in the news. This is not news to, to those of us who work in this. But this and, is why we have a different flu vaccine every year because the flu vaccine, the flu right. virus mutates. Okay. All right. What is the difference between what we just heard about vaccines being 90% effective versus 100% prevention just shown? Again, depends completely on the primary endpoint, whether you're trying to prevent against asymptomatic infections, symptomatic infections, hospitalizations, or death. And it kind of goes in that order. It's a very high bar to prevent against asymptomatic infections for a respiratory pathogen, easier to prevent against death. And um, each of the different clinical trials define symptomatic infections in, in different ways. So the percentages are slightly different, where they were conducted, um, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, each had South, South Africa as one of the trial sites, which had a variant, which reduced some of the efficacy. So uh, a lot of different things. And, and yeah, the percentages can change over time. All right. So next question, what's the difference between mRNA vaccines and traditional vaccines? Um, and and uh, let's see, gene therapy and so on. Um, no, this is not traditional gene therapy where you would modify the genome. This is essentially giving uh, your cells a uh, uh, software that lets the cells make the spike protein as opposed to making the spike protein in a test tube and putting that spike protein into your body. So um, they're in that sense, very similar to traditional vaccines. And as Jason mentioned in his um, discussion, there's different kinds of traditional vaccines, including subunit vaccines, live attenuated viruses, et cetera, et cetera, dead viruses uh, and, and uh, other modalities. And so all of these modalities are in clinical trials right now. The attenuated virus and the, and the dead virus vaccines take longer to develop, so we'll see. The reason you're seeing the RNA vaccines fast and first is because these new tech platforms have allowed a very, very rapid R&D cycle, okay? But we're also seeing problems with them because scale up is harder because this is a new tech. Yeah, building, building the plane as they fly it, right? trying to build the manufacturing plant as they're distributing and making it. How effective are the existing vaccines to known and unknown variants to SARS-CoV-2? depends completely on the variant. The UK variant isn't that much different from the original Wuhan or Washington isolate. Uh, the South African variant, of all the variants, the South African variant is sort of the most concerning. It, it contains the most number of changes. Um, uh, and we'd say probably in general reduces vaccine efficacy by about 25, 30%. So it's good to start at 95%. And if you drop 25 or 30, you're still, you're still in good shape. Uh, can't know how good they're going to be against unknown variants, but the vaccines elicit antibodies, they elicit T cells, there's a lot going on, and we think they'll continue to be protective, and companies are developing boosters and reformulating, Moderna's already making a South African variant of their mRNA as a boost, so uh, I think we're, we're well positioned to deal with the variants, and there is a limited amount of mutational uh, space to which the virus can escape without hurting itself, right? So at some point, in order to continue to escape our antibodies and our immune system, it will actually suffer a fitness cost. Um, what's herd immunity and how does it really work? Um, the short answer is I don't know because I'm not an epidemiologist and I don't study these things. But the basic idea is you're trying to reduce the reservoir of people who have na naive immune systems who can serve as hosts for the virus. So by vaccination or by prior infection, we are going to reduce the space, uh, the number of people that the virus can jump to. So if you give the virus to four people, that's a transmission of four, right? But if three of those four people are no longer able to get sick because they've been vaccinated or have had prior COVID infection, you can only give it to one more other person. This is the R0 number. And so the goal is to get this R0 number below one, and at that point, the viral outbreaks shrink. What I'm imagining in our near future is that as vaccines become broadly available, but not everybody wants a vaccine or can't get a vaccine, 
we're going to have large scale containment and small scale outbreaks, local outbreaks, for example, in some anti-vax communities and so on. There's a history of that in, in other contexts. I'm gonna skip the question on, on photonics, but I'll answer three quick ones from, from Bill. What makes an RNA-based vaccine so good? Um, they, they're good. It, it's not clear they're actually that much better than some of the other vaccines. Um, and, and we'll sort of see how they do. Speed is a major thing because it's always mRNA, how, how they purify and produce the mRNA is very quick. It's agnostic to what the mRNA is encoded. So they could easily be encoding spike protein and then switch the influenza hemagglutinin protein. So it's a very rapid response. It also doesn't require a lot of knowledge about the protein and how to purify that particular protein. It's just mRNA. And it makes your body produce the protein, which can be good for, the, for immunity. So there are some advantages. There's also some disadvantages in terms of the magnitude of the immune response that can be obtained compared to in directly injecting an, an adjuvanted protein. It's also cost, so not something widely ap uh, uh, applicable to like the global population and developing countries. So there are some drawbacks. It will definitely be a major platform and maybe the preferred platform for pandemic response due to speed. Um, I don't know anything about exosome-based uh, vaccines, uh, so I'll have to skip that. The co Peter Diamandis' uh, COVAX vaccine is a peptide-based vaccine. I haven't seen any data on it. Wouldn't be my, my, my top choice. Uh, just uh, you're not going to get the level of neutralizing antibodies that recognize more complex folds of proteins rather than linear peptides. Right. Operation warp speed. I think um, a lot of times we forget that companies won't do something unless they're going to make a profit. And de-risking very costly scale up of production is a major bottleneck for uh, vaccine and any therapeutic development. So when the government says they'll backstop any losses for a large scale scale up, um, that allows companies to produce lots of doses quickly. And so I think that's at least one major benefit of Operation Warp Speed is that it removes the business consideration for making pandemic level uh, dosage. I completely agree. I don't think there's anything in terms of the knowledge, like these, the Moderna vaccine, we, we'd help design within days of the sequence before Operation Warp Speed was even formed, but just allowing the companies to just start ramping up um, is really probably the, the benefit. Mm -hmm. Patrick asks, how do you modify the spike protein and how are the spikes mass produced for vaccines? Uh, in our case, we use a rational approach where we look at the, the structure of the protein and the pre-fusion and the post-fusion conformation understand which portions of the molecule refold and change shape, and then design in substitutions and amino acid changes that help restrict the conformational change. We can introduce disulfide bonds to act as like covalent stables that link two regions together, add in prolines, which rigidify certain parts. And in terms of mass production, uh, something like Novavax, where they are using insect cells to, to produce tons of protein and bioreactors and purify it, or again, the genetic-based ones, they're just having our own bodies make it. They're just feeding in the instructions in mRNA or DNA, and then our own cells produce it, which is pretty efficient. Yep, 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 yep. I should mention that when we were designing the second gen spike, Jason's designs performed less well than his students. Yes. <laughs> Way <laughs> to point to say, that out, Elia. I have to say that, right? <laughs> My designs didn't exist, so it's okay. <laughs> Long-term safety, we don't know, but in general, these vaccines are very safe. I think what Ilya is saying is what a good teacher you are, Jason. Yeah. I have to do that, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. we're learning from Jason. So let's see. Uh, uh, threats to RNA delivery mechanism, uh, RNA delivery mechanism threats. Uh, can this be a biological weapon? I'm gonna skip that one. That's beyond my pay grade. Okay, hold on. I, I, let me jump. For long-term safety, we don't know, but that, do, that doesn't mean we don't know anything, right? Like for instance, we don't know the effectiveness of the vaccine delivered in a red room because we didn't do any studies to specifically look at vaccines, but based on everything we know about different colored rooms, we would expect no difference. And so the same thing with long-term safety, uh, the mRNA, ha mRNA vaccines have been tested in people for years. Moderna is not a new company and the mRNA is degraded very quickly as are the proteins that they're being produced. So from that aspect, we don't expect any long-term safety. We'll see, but we're, we're not particularly concerned. We're actually much more concerned about long-term COVID infections 
right? People with very severe COVID have been reporting months of a uh, brain fogginess or heart issues. This is gonna be a major area of research, understanding long-term COVID. This is much more of a problem than any long-term safety effects possibly from a vaccine. Uh, in terms of biological weapons, yeah, people could produce RNA that makes our body uh, make a biological weapon. That's actually a super hard thing to do and it is not optimal, right? Biological weapons in general haven't been particularly good. You have to disseminate it. Um, and so trying to make an mRNA and then walk up and inject people, there's much, there, there's other things you could do uh, rather than using mRNA in that way. Yeah, I should mention biological weapons usually serve a function as, as a weapon of terror, not a weapon of destruction because they capture our minds and hearts much more than they actually cause death. Um, yeah, many agencies, uh, so there are many agencies and institutions are planning to look at long-term health effects of the virus, um, as well as the vaccine, but really the, the virus, the NIH and others are, are really concerned about long-term COVID. Uh, why do some vaccines need two shots and some need one, some refrigeration and some not? It depends on the formulation, the refrigeration and the cold chain depends on the formulation of the vaccine and the adjuvant. So for example, in the RNA vaccines, you, the vaccine, the RNA molecule itself isn't injected into your cells. There's actually a formulation that requires uh, a fatty uh, coating. And it's in fact that fatty coating, including, and the RNA itself, which need to be stored, stored ultra cold. I think Pfizer initially requested that it be stored at minus 80 or so degrees. Now they've been approved to store at minus 20 degrees. These freezers are um, not dissimilar to the freezers you have in your house. So that um, significantly increases the range of the Pfizer vaccine delivery to conventional pharmacies, not just super center sites. So that was an early, I think, um, safety that they had and they've now expanded this cold storage. They've reduced the cold storage need. Um, that's that's the cold storage question. Why two shots and why one? I guess Jason can, can discuss it, but that's how the trials were designed. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. So in general, almost all vaccines will benefit from a booster. Uh, so the, the Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccine, the efficacy is in the 70s. That's about what people are estimating Pfizer and Moderna one-shot efficacy would be. Uh, practically, Johnson & Johnson is, was way behind to market and they wanted to come up with a unique angle, a unique selling point. And so one dose uh, versus the two dose. There's, there's some potential concern because it's an adenoviral vector, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that you may generate some immunity against the virus, against the adenovirus in the vaccine, such that a boost um, wouldn't be as effective because your immune response would actually kind of attack the vaccine. That's being tested. They do have some uh, two boost vaccine trials. So, so we'll look and see. Yeah, so the J&J &J may become a, a dual shot vaccine soon. They're still in trials on that. That's a clear, that's a key point. And that can be partially mitigated with different adenovirus delivery vectors for second shot. Should we use the final results of immunization after different times to help pick a strategic strategy for each patient who comes down from a new variant? Um, we don't really have the capability to do any sort of individualized medicine, um, really we can barely get vaccines into people. So, so I think at this point, uh, you know, people have talked about, well, should we test people who are already infected? And if they're already infected, don't vaccinate them or give them a single dose. Ideally, yes, uh, but our testing infrastructure is poor and uh, we really just need to get shots into arms, at, at least for now. I'm gonna skip the blood type question because I don't know the answer. I'm not a clinical doctor. But uh, I know the answer to that one, Ilya. Type O is by far the most resistant. It's practically invulnerable, is what I think. You should ask Jay what his blood type <laughs> is as he. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm type O, by the way. I'm also. I'm okay. Ready. Can a vaccinated person be an asymptomatic carrier of COVID 19? This is a million dollar question that a lot of people are looking into right now. The, sh the short answer is we're not sure, but it looks like there will be a conf some immunity conferred, not complete. And that's coming out of uh, real world data out of Israel and the United Kingdom where people are following folks who have been vaccinated with regular checkups, right? You need to have a cohort you can follow with regular NP swab checkups over time to see if they actually carry the virus in their upper respiratory passages. There's also been some non-human primate trial data where a non-human primate were vaccinated and then SARS-CoV-2 was nasally injected to challenge their immune system. And that data looked very promising as well, right? Jason, you saw that. Did you, did you see yeah. that? Yeah. I would say the answer to this is, is um, 
I think, yes, they can be uh, asymptomatic carriers, but it's it'll depend on a number of factors, including duration from vaccination, right? Because we're, we're saying that it's not going to provide lifelong immunity. So X number of months or years after, um, you, you will be infected. In the short term, weeks or months after, we're, after vaccination, you're at super high immune responses. Um, it'll probably reduce the ability to have virus replicating in the nose. It depends to what level, uh, but the less virus you have replicating, the less easily you'll be able to, to tr transmit because there is a dose dependency. If I cough a million particles into Ilya's face, he's more likely to be infected than if I cough a hundred particles. So there's, there's a lot of nuance in the question. It's an important question, but likely people can be asymptomatic carriers, but probably their ability to transmit is reduced um, if they're vaccinated. I, I, I want to I ask a follow-up to that, Jason, before Jessica goes. Um, it, I understand that some vaccinations, the immunity wears off in time. I loved your description of if we carried all these antibodies forever, our blood would be like syrup at that point. So it's meant to be for a period. Most of them are meant to be for a period of time. But you mentioned some lifelong vaccines as well. For the ones that do not have a lifelong impact, do you still have a better ability to respond for the rest of your life such that you might get sick a year after, you know, when it wears off, but your, but your likelihood of serious illness is decreased? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and that's true for like, for, for those flu seasons where the flu vaccine isn't great and the efficacy maybe drops to 25, 30%, the people being vaccinated, they still might get flu, but the likelihood of them developing into more severe disease is low. okay. So, uh, because in general, we do have these lifelong, these memory cells can last a, a, a lifetime and they can rapidly reactivate. And so they, they may not blunt that initial infection because it takes some time for the re-stimulation, but they, they will be there. Um, Great. Variants are the, the tricky one because it kind of, that has the most effect on our ability to respond because we're basically training our immune system to recognize a burglar that looks one way and if the burglar changes, we don't really recognize it anymore. I